Welcome to the last two weeks of the term. Where did the other eight weeks go? Um, yay. <laughs> ready for it to be done. Ready for it to start being warm and actually springtime instead of uh, this strange cold stuff here. Um, it was a chilly ride in this morning. Definitely a chilly ride in. Uh, <clears throat> so today we're going to continue to talk about regulation, um, particularly in terms of some of the other ways that Transcription factors, i.e. specific transcription factors, interact with DNA, um, particularly in terms of the eukaryotic systems. Um, a lot of that, again, still has to do with dimers and motifs. And talk a little bit about why dimers are so useful. Last time we talked about it because of the specificity that you can get from having two copies of a single monomer. And then today we'll talk a little bit about why that's so useful in terms of mixing and matching, which is a really useful process. The other thing you can get with dimerization and particularly interacting with DNA is cooperativity. And the cooperativity here, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about the Rec A and single-stranded binding protein. One binds and then it helps a whole bunch more bind. It turns out that this is really useful in terms of gene regulation because then it kind of acts like a switch, turn off, turn on, as opposed to sort of a, a long sort of drawn out process dependent on concentration. So we'll look more at that. And then of course, we mostly care about nucleosomes and how DNA can be accessed when it's still bound in a nucleosome, when it's in a chromatin com complex. And hopefully I emphasize this enough when we went through it the first time around, but I think it's very important to realize that even euchromatin, you know, the non-compacted chromatin, still has nucleosomes associated with it. It's just not completely compacted, all those nucleosomes right next to each other. So anytime you talk about eukaryotic, any kind of DNA binding protein, but particularly in terms of transcriptional regulation, has to deal with nucleosomes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then Assuming that we have time, which hopefully we will, um, we'll start to talk about some examples of regulation. And we'll start talking about the bacterial regulation principles. Yes, they're frighteningly important as far as bacteria are concerned, but it turns out you can take those as nice models for understanding how eukaryotic transcriptional regulation works as well. So we'll spend some time talking about that. But before that, I wanted to quickly review this whole idea of dimers and dimers interacting with DNA. First part of that again, okay, we've got two now identical proteins. So these sort of green kind of comma-like structures, these represent a dimeric protein. So this protein is identical to this protein. It's got a DNA binding motif that binds to 5 prime AACAC, which means that this one over here also binds to 5 prime AACAC. These two together now are going to bind to 10 base pairs as opposed to just the one binding to 5. 10 base pairs, of course, gives you a lot more specificity. But at the same time, you're just encoding one protein. And that one protein here, instead of again binding to 5 nucleotides, can now bind to 10. And this is a great process, particularly if you're a bacterium and have a relatively small genome, is you can now have one protein that's actually binding to more DNA and giving you more specificity. So the dimerization helps a lot with that specificity process, and we'll see a little bit later on um, cooperativity-wise. This particular one is a fascinating transcriptional regulator from bacteriophage lambda that we'll talk about next term in the lambda section of virology. Last time we talked about the helix turn helix. This is the DNA binding motif that you find in many, many, many bacterial transcriptional regulators. Has a recognition helix and then a helix on top of that which kind of holds it into the major groove of DNA. The eukaryotic I like to call this equivalent of that, is something called the homeodomain. Now, it's called domain. That means that it actually does now actually have a structure in and of itself. So unlike the HTH, which is a motif, does not have a particular structure, it's not stable, the homeodomains are. And really all that the homeodomains are, hang on just a second, um, is 
a helix turn helix, so here, to helix turn helix, with an extra helix stacked on top of it. And this, these three helices together, again, actually are stable, and they form a domain, and the recognition helix, say this helix 3 here, just like you see in the bacterial HTHs, they've got various amino acid side chains that interact mostly through hydrogen bonds with bases in the major groove. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so the motif in and of itself, that's not stable. So it's got to be connected to the rest of a domain in some way. So what does that mean? Split a domain? If, no, if, it, if it's not stable by itself, it's not a domain. Oh. As soon as it's attached to something else, that could be a domain. Depends, it depends if it's actually stable. And stable, I mean stable structure, which means, of course, we have a stable function. Yes, good. OK, it's this first thing Monday morning, I know. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, the idea again with the homeo domains, and in fact, many of these homeo domains, we'll talk about them later, turn out to be very important domains of eukaryotic transcriptional regulators. So many, many, many homeo domains that are here. This is also one thing to mention, as well as interactions here in the major groove of DNA with this alpha helix. You also have some interactions. This is true for almost all homeo domains reaching over into the minor groove of DNA as well. So it's not just major groove interactions. You also have charge-charge interactions, particularly at the end of this helix with the phosphate. So these will have positively charged interacting with the phosphates, which you kind of looked at um, before. So this is one of the major classes of eukaryotic DNA binding and you can, you know, this in fact is a domain because it's just it's uh, the whole thing itself. There are also some other motifs. So again, these don't have structures in and of themselves, known as zinc fingers. Now, so what's a zinc finger? Um, one of my, in fact, one of the very few things I remember from my one and only undergraduate biology course, you know, showing out of where my, yeah, here I'm a biology professor. I had one biology course in undergrad. Uh, one of the questions was, um, can you get a zinc finger stuck in a leucine zipper? So um, we'll see the leucine zipper in just a second here. So <clears throat> what's a zinc finger? Um, a zinc finger actually is very, very similar to the helix turn helix motif or the DNA binding part of a homeodomain. It's literally putting an alpha helix in the major groove of DNA. But it's not stacking another helix on top of it. It's got a couple of beta strands instead that are holding the helix where it needs to be in the major groove of DNA. So here's an example of one of these right here. Here's our recognition helix in green, and then two beta strands right next to it. Why are these called zinc fingers? Well, because there's a zinc atom which is associated with them. There are two sort of major kinds of zinc fingers. Many of them have cysteines that are associated with them. In some cases, actually, four cysteine residues. So here we have two cysteines here and two zincs here. Oh, sorry, two histidines here, two cysteines here, and a zinc in the middle. This is how this motif is packed together. Again, it's the really important thing is getting this alpha helix into the major groove of DNA. One of the really neat things about these zinc finger proteins is that cysteines, and for that matter histidines, are also really pretty rare when you're looking at amino acid sequence. So if you've got an amino acid sequence of a protein, and it's got a whole bunch of cysteines in it, and particularly cysteines that are separated by two random, and that's what these two X's uh, refer to, random amino acids. So cysteines, two random amino acids, bunch of amino acids, histidine, histidine, or four cysteines, also each separated by two amino acids. Just by looking at the sequence, you can get a pretty good idea that this is likely to bind to zinc, and in many cases, it's going to be binding to DNA. So it's one of the very few cases where just by looking at primary sequence, you can get an idea of what that function is going to be.
because you're not going to have just randomly cysteines and for that matter histidines that are associated with each other. So there are some other examples of zinc containing DNA binding proteins. This is one down here at the bottom. Also has these regular motifs, again sequence motifs, which bind to zinc and help hold alpha helices into major groups of DNA. We're going to spend quite a long time talking about nuclear hormone receptors. These are very well studied gene regulatory proteins, of course in eukaryotes because they have nuclei, um, but also quite a few other transcription factors also have these zinc finger motifs, make an alpha helix, sticks into the major group DNA, and again mostly through hydrogen bond interactions with the bases in the major groove, that's how you get the specificity of binding. But just in case you thought it was easy, it's not just alpha helices. So there's kind of a fun story that goes with this, um, again, back in the dark ages. When I was in graduate school, I was working together with a postdoc in the lab where I was doing my graduate degree, a um, woman by the name of Ann North, and she was working on a bacterial DNA binding protein transcriptional regulator called the MET repressor. And the, right as she was working on it, a different group actually had figured out the structure of this MET repressor protein. And they said, oh, cool, look at this MET repressor protein. It's got you now this alpha helix here and this alpha helix here. They're just about the right distance apart in the major groups of DNA. So clearly that's how it's going to bind to DNA. And she said, and the people she was working with said, but that doesn't match our genetics. All our genetics say that mutants over here in this part of the protein actually are those that change the DNA binding. And lo and behold, the geneticists were right and the structural biologists were wrong. Um, and here is actually two beta strands that also can fit into the major groove of DNA. So it's these beta strands right here. Just like we have alpha helices, the side chains are sticking out on the outside of your alpha helix. Beta strands, they're sticking up and down. And so they can also just as easily interact with the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors which are sitting in the major group of DNA. So say the majority of interactions that you have with DNA are going to be alpha helices in the major groove, but it's not just alpha helices that are sitting in the major groove of DNA. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of DNA binding motifs. I want to transition a little bit to something that is really a dimerization motif, but lots of people think about it as DNA binding motifs. And if I remember correctly, actually the textbook even has this wrong as well. So this is something that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about here. So there's something called leucine zipper proteins, right? So leucine zippers, we already talked about leucine zippers. These are also coiled coils, every seven amino acids. You've got a large hydrophobic residue, usually leucine. That means that these things can dimerize with each other and the alpha helices wrap around each other. So it turns out that many of these proteins also have a basic helix down here at the bottom. Could be all one continuous helix. So up here, it's got leucines every seven amino acids. And down here, it's got a bunch of basic amino acids, which are what? Arginines and lysines, exactly. And so those interact with the DNA when they're sitting in the major groove. And in this case, it's often one extended major groove. Um, so they're kind of coming down like scissors, sitting here right next to each other, as opposed to the helix turn helix or also any of these other DNA binding motifs that often will sit in adjacent major groove separated from each other. So right next to each other. So here, the dimerization motif is this leucine zipper. And again, often you will have a basic helix that's attached to it. Another dimerization motif, which is really quite common in eukaryotic transcriptional regulators, is this helix loop helix structure. Um, this is not to be confused with a helix turn helix. Sorry about the terminology. So helix loop helix is what you have here. It's a dimerization motif. So you're putting these two, in this case, blue and green together. Each monomer comes together and forms a dimer. And in most cases, this is actually called a B 
helix loop helix or a basic helix connected to a helix loop helix. And again, basic helix has got lots of lysines and arginines associated with it. That's going to interact with the DNA. So BHLH proteins, again, we'll talk about a number of these specifically well-known, well-characterized transcriptional regulators. So why am I spending so much time talking about dimers? We already had the idea, again, in bacteria that you've got two monomers, which can each bind to a half site, gives you much higher specificity, is a efficient way to have DNA binding. But probably even more importantly is that these dimers can actually mix and match with each other. So if you have a dimerization motif, say a leucine zipper, then that leucine zipper, any protein that has an alpha helix and every seven amino acids a large hydrophobic residue, can interact with that, can dimerize with it. So what that means is you can mix and match different kinds of potentially even DNA binding proteins if you have the DNA binding motif connected to your dimerization motif. So this just example down here, we've got dark green and light green, a homodimer, i.e. you've got two of the same here, is going to bind to one DNA binding site, a homodimer of the other kind, the light green, will bind to a different DNA binding site, and a heterodimer will bind to yet a third DNA binding site. And if you can think about this, it actually can really expand quite a bit. You know, the more different kinds of monomers you can have that can associate with each other in terms of dimerization, the more different DNA binding sites you can recognize. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how they can interact. And there are actually two examples right here. The MAT-A1, MAT-alpha-2. Not important, we're not going to talk about the actual details here. But here, there are two very different proteins. Hopefully it's pretty obvious that this one has a very different structure from that one. At the very least, this one has four helices, this only has three. Um, but this heterodimer formation is really very common in terms of binding to DNA and giving you different specificities. And also, as we'll talk about in just a second, the cooperativity in terms of how they're interacting. You can even actually have multiple DNA binding domains that are in a single protein. And so this is one down here. This is actually a protein that has both a homeodomain and what's called a POW domain. Not important what that POW domain stands for. Um, but these are two different DNA binding proteins that are associated in a single protein. And again, that gives you higher specificity because you've got different DNA sequences that each of those DNA binding motifs are going to be associated with. So these are the proteins. What do these sites actually look like? Here's an example of a, if we can get it to move, um, <clears throat> a DNA binding site for a transcriptional regulator called NANOG. We'll talk more about NANOG probably on Wednesday at this rate. Um, NANOG is a protein that if you express it at the right time in the right place can actually turn whatever cell it is to a pluripotent stem cell, which is really amazing because that can then develop into all kinds of other different cells. So um, very important DNA regulatory protein um, binds to this sequence. The sequence in and of itself is not important. No, I'm not going to ask you the details about it. Um, again, this is one of these consensus sequences. So it binds really well to something that's TAA, TTGC, but can also bind to some of these other sites like CAA, GTAC, et cetera. And this is literally, again, just from lining up all of these sequences relative to each other. So if you just had this sequence, so seven nucleotides, if you think about the human genome, which is where nanog is actually being expressed, there are lots and lots of these seven nucleotide sequences. Um, and you don't necessarily want to have nanog binding to all of them all of the time. So again, as we talked about before, seven nucleotides is not going to give you enough specificity. Fourteen nucleotides will definitely give you specific, uh, excuse me, sufficient specificity to find in a genome, much less at random. And this is also just looking at what we had before, dimers versus heterodimers, and each of those interacting with each other in order to bind specifically under the appropriate conditions. So this is you know, one thing, and it turns out that nanog is almost always present 
in this heterodimer form with other transcriptional regulators. So heterodimerization, mixing and matching, higher specificity, what other reason do we have for wanting to have dimers? That's this one, the whole idea of cooperativity. So the idea here is that if you have one protein, or for that matter, a heterodimer that is always a heterodimer, if you increase the protein concentration, you'll have more and more of this DNA site that's bound to this particular protein. And it has this kind of you know, increasing exponential function here. So at a small con protein concentration, you have a little bit, the more, more, et cetera. Um, this is OK, but it's kind of hard to use this as a switch, because you know, when you half through here, getting from 0 to 1, it's a pretty large difference in terms of protein concentration. If, however, you have monomers of the proteins that you're looking at, and these monomers, you know, can't most of the time the monomer in and of itself doesn't bind very well to DNA, but if it forms a dimer, then it binds really well to DNA. What that means is, is that this curve of protein concentration versus occupancy and the amount of your bound protein versus unbound protein changes really rapidly in a relatively small concentration range. So again, it's this equilibrium that's happening. These guys, monomer, dimer formation, as soon as those dimers form, then they'll bind cooperatively to the DNA. That gives you much more of this switch off versus on kinds of concentration. And that turns out to be really important if you're thinking about regulating lots of different circuits. You know, gene that needs to be turned on here, turned on there, et cetera. You don't usually want to say, OK, we're going to have a little bit of this gene turned on here and a little bit of that gene turned on there. It's a lot easier to regulate if you have things that you can turn on and turn off. So it turns out that this kind of cooperativity, where you've got binding by dimeric proteins, but only after they have dimerized. So this dimerization gives you a two-state kinetics, which those of you who are you know, taking lots of chemistry know all about, um, that gives you much more of an all or nothing kind of process. So DNA binding proteins. All happy with DNA binding proteins? What is that? Yes. So are they, um, they can go either way. They can be inhibit or activate transcription. So we'll, we'll talk much more about inhibition and activation of transcription after the clicker question. Okay. <laughs> Great lead in, right? <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> dimeric. HTH, helix turn helix containing proteins often have their recognition helices about 3.4 nanometers apart, apparently, so they can do which of the following? Act as leucine zippers, form heterodimers, bind cooperatively, bind adjacent major grooves, bind major and minor grooves. Three, two, eight. No consensus yet. Talk about what you decided. Figure out why. Go ahead. That's your clicker question. Yeah, quick, quick. 
to go again? Yes, all of us good. I see nodding heads. Good. Okay. Oh, actually, if I use the other remote, that might help. Sorry about that. <laughs> this one's the one I'm looking for. Make sure you vote. Ten, five, no more votes, all done, good. So adjacent major grooves, why adjacent major grooves? Because they're going to be on the same side of DNA. And so your dimers are both going to be sitting on this side of the DNA. So, and that's exactly where you have 3.4 <coughs> nanometers apart. Um, so they can do which of the following. So, um, D is the correct answer. Okay, so <clears throat> have you seen this already? Um, this is all great and wonderful. And again, most helix turn helix motifs are actually in bacterial systems, which is wonderful because that side of the DNA is mostly going to be accessible. What about eukaryotic systems? We've got nucleosomes. How do you get nucleosomes and sequence specific binding proteins. How can they interact with each other? And this is stuff that we've kind of talked about before. Nucleosome breathing happens. So if you have a nucleosome wrapped around, it's approximately 150 base pairs of DNA around the outside. The ends in particular will dissociate from the nucleosome, reassociate from the nucleosome, dissociate, reassociate. So this breathing um, allows you to have binding to this particular DNA binding site. So the, in this case, the cis regulatory sequence, that's what your DNA binding protein or transcriptional regulator is going to interact with. So most of the time, again, the big arrow over here, it'll be associated, but about 1 20th of the time, this will come off. And so what this means is you will have, so we will move, um, <clears throat> some cases where your DNA binding protein, again here in green, can bind to this sequence. Um, however, this is still a lot less frequent than DNA that doesn't have nucleosomes that are associated with it. And so just the fact that you have nucleosomes associated with DNA where you want to have binding of different proteins, say a promoter, uh, that will cause you to have much less opportunities for DNA binding. And so we talk about regulation later on, Moving nucleosomes around turns out to be very important in terms of getting good transcriptional initiation. This is what happens when you have DNA which is near the end of where it's wrapped around the nucleosome. On the other hand, if you've got DNA right in the middle, that actually is really hard for sequence-specific DNA binding proteins to interact with and on the order of about 200 times lower than you have with non-nucleosome bound DNA. <clears throat> So how do you deal with this? Well, one thing, you can move the nucleosomes. Another way that this can happen is you can have sequential binding of different regulatory proteins. And you can also think about this kind of as another reason to have cooperativity, multiple different DNA binding proteins associating with the DNA. If you have a DNA binding protein associating with DNA that's otherwise associated with the nucleosome, then that DNA is no longer associated with the nucleosome. So the next piece of DNA can also be more easily bound. And so the binding of one of these regulatory proteins, say the green one, will help the blue one to actually bind to that particular DNA. So having multiple DNA binding sites, multiple proteins next to each other, once you get binding by the first, that will help binding to the second one, also an example of cooperativity. So how do we know about 
all of these things and all the DNA binding proteins. So this brings us back to a quick aside into methods. I wanted to go over a couple of the different methods that people use to discover how DNA binding proteins associate with DNA. The first of these is called the EMSA or the band shift assay. So this is partly why I talked about our methods way back when in the beginning of the class, which we've all forgotten since then. But um, the basic idea here is that if you have a particular piece of DNA, it is going to move through a gel with a certain mobility. So here, all of these different DNA fragments move through the gel at this mobility. That's relative to their size. If there's now a protein bound to that DNA, it's going to be bigger. And so it's going to go slower through a gel. So in this case, you've got a cell extract with lots of different proteins in it. The C1 protein is a really big protein, so it's going to shift the mobility in the DNA, this is why it's called an electrophoretic mobility shift assay, to a particular position. If you've got a smaller protein, that will bind here, et cetera, all the way through. So that's the conceptual process. What something like this actually really looks like is you've done some kind of chromatography. So you have, very often it's going to be a nuclear extract. So you get a bunch of cells, you purify nuclei, mostly through centrifugation, and then you take all of those proteins and you put them on a column and you collect fractions that come off of that column based on how much that particular protein interacts with your column, say an ion exchange column, for instance. And then you want to know what's in each of those individual fractions that are coming off the column. So in each of those fractions, what you do is you take a piece of DNA that's been labeled. In this case, it's radioactively labeled, but whatever label is. And you mix it together with the proteins that are present right here. And it turns out that you'll get some of that DNA that has this mobility, but some of it's been shifted, say, like right here, C2. Now it'll correspond to where this protein is. As you go across the column and collect all these different fractions, you see different kinds of shifts. So here's the shift from the C2 protein, here's the shift from C3 protein, here's C1, and they're all alluding at slightly different positions as they come off of the column here. Turns out that this is how a lot of proteins were originally isolated for some of the transcription factors. You remember all those TF2 transcription factors, A, B, C, E, F, H, etc.? Those actually come from exactly this kind of experiment. So A were the proteins that bound to promoters and came off early. B were the ones that came off next. C that came off later, etc. So the nomenclature here is not just completely random. It actually goes back to those original experiments where they're doing gel shifts. So here, the band shift gel shift assay depends on you having a specific fragment. And so in the example that I'm using of these proteins which are binding to promoter sequences, you have a promoter sequence. And then you look at what proteins are binding to that promoter sequence. You don't know what those proteins are. That's why you're kind of doing this assay to see where they are. You're then doing chromatography to separate each of them from each other. And this works well if you're just trying to find each of these proteins. And this particular purification, say, be an ion exchange one. However, if you're trying to isolate a very specific DNA binding protein, What's the best kind of chromatography to use to get really high specificity? Affinity, affinity chromatography, exactly. Some of you have the notes. Um, so affinity chromatography for getting DNA binding proteins is great. And it turns out affinity chromatography is really, really important because most of these transcriptional regulators, so I mentioned last time, large amounts of the genome, up to about 10% of the genome, encode for these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins that are gene regulatory proteins. That's the DNA. The amount of protein that's made is usually extremely small for any of these proteins. So you need to have a really good purification technique to be able to purify these proteins in the first place. So the, actually the development of DNA affinity chromatography was to isolate a bunch of these different proteins. So 
This is just the basic idea. You have usually actually two separate steps of chromatography, two different columns. The first one, which is a nonspecific but DNA-like, and it says DNA with many different sequences. Usually it's actually a DNA analog that you use here. Here you go, a mixture of proteins, and it's usually not total cell proteins. It'll be your nuclear extract of some different kind. You're looking for these red proteins. Because these are the ones which are binding to your specific sequence. But there's also a bunch of other proteins that don't associate with DNA at all. So the first thing you want to do is just get all the proteins that are going to bind to DNA in the first place. And so that's your column with DNA or DNA-like sequences. Those that don't bind, the blue ones, go straight through. Now you have concentrated, so you've got more of these red dots relative to all the dots up here in this situation, but now it's all of the different DNA binding proteins here. Then you take this mixture of proteins, put it onto a column that has a specific DNA sequence on it, and then the proteins that don't bind, all the green ones, will go through, and those that do, the red ones, will be stuck to the column, and then you can take them off of the column, usually by washing it some kind of very high salt wash. So this is a way of purifying those individual DNA binding proteins if you have that very specific sequence that you know that it binds to. So that's great, but how do you figure out what that very specific sequence is? You know, that sequence is very, very short. You know, GGG, CCC, only six nucleotides. Usually for some of these experiments where you're doing a band shift, it's going to be hundreds of nucleotides. Um, it's a promoter sequence. And those promoter sequences we talked about in eukaryotic systems turns out they should be hundreds of th thousands of nucleotides long. So to figure out exactly what that specific sequence is that you want to use for your DNA affinity chromatography, you're going to have to do something else other than just these band shift experiments. So one of those things that you can do is what's called DNA footprinting or DNA footprinting. How DNA footprinting works is you have your protein, in this case the big blue one, and some DNA. That DNA is labeled at one end. Um, in this case, it would be polynucleotide kinase because it's the five prime end. And then you take that DNA and you chop it up into smaller pieces. You can do that either in the presence of this protein down at the bottom or in the absence of the protein here at the top. And this is shown here in the presence of the protein. This DNA has been chopped into lots of different lengths, lots of different lengths, but you're missing all of these lengths here in the middle. And that's because what's doing the chopping can't chop this DNA because this protein is in the way. And so that's what's called the footprint that you have down here. Here's your footprint with proteins. The DNA is not chopped up at all of these positions. Without the protein, it's chopped up right here. This is one of those high resolution gels where you literally every single nucleotide is being cut. And so you can now identify about 10 base pairs here that your favorite protein is actually associated with. So this is a way of really zooming in to exactly the sequence that your protein is bound to. So you could have started out with one of these electrophoretic mobility shift assays, a big piece of DNA, then you purify the proteins with chromatography. This is regular chromatography, non-affinity chromatography. Then take that piece of DNA and your purified protein and find out where exactly it binds with a DNA's footprint. Yeah? How do you tell which nucleotide is which in order to get the sequence? So how do you tell which nucleotide is which in order to get the sequence? So here, this radio-labeled piece of DNA, now what you can do, you can do DNA sequencing on this same piece of DNA in the absence of the protein. And that will tell you, OK, this is C-A-T-T-G-C-A. And literally, when you do these experiments, almost all the time, and I should have pulled one up, um, you'll have this kind of, you know, this is what the DNA is when it's got no protein, this is what it has without, with the protein, and then right next to it, you have a DNA sequencing ladder. So you'll be running them at exactly the same time. So you know what the sequence is at that particular length. It's a great question. Okay, so this is great if you happen to have a piece of DNA that your protein binds to. If you don't have any idea 
what your protein binds to, then you've got to come up with a different technique. And so that's one of these here. The so-called CellX technique, I can't even remember what the abbreviation is, we always call it CellX, Systematic Evolution of Ligands by Exponential Enrichment. So the whole idea here is you have a protein that you think binds to DNA, but you don't know what that actually binds to. So say, for instance, you've sequenced a genome and you have a protein that has what looks like a zinc finger protein in it, because you can see the cysteines in it. What does it bind to? No idea. So what you can do is you can take random nucleotides, and now we're actually really good at sequencing. We didn't talk about so not sequencing, synthesizing random nucleotide sequences. So you get a whole bunch of random nucleotide sequences. You mix them together with your favorite DNA binding protein. And then you have some way of separating this piece of DNA that binds to your protein from all of the other ones. And usually it's something like a gel mobility shift assay. So you've got a whole mixture of different DNAs. You put them onto a gel. There'll be one place where that has a mobility shift. You take that and literally cut it out of your gel and use that DNA, and usually this process is repeated multiple different times. This arrow is not in your textbook, um, but you'll take this DNA that's associated with your protein, you'll put it back into a pool of other ones, do this process again multiple different times, and eventually you'll end up with this particular DNA sequence that binds to your protein, and you can determine the sequence of this DNA fragment by adding some pieces to the ends, doing a regular DNA sequencing reaction. So this is a completely artificial arrangement. These are all synthesized pieces of DNA and a whole pool of them. So you have you know, this process, you figure out this sequence binds to my favorite DNA binding protein, but it doesn't tell you whether that's what's actually really going on inside a cell. And so that brings us to our last set of techniques, which are actually three sort of different ways of doing actually almost exactly the same thing, which is finding out what sequence your favorite protein binds to in the cell at any particular given time. And the technique that's in the textbook is chromatin immunoprecipitation, and then some variations on that theme. The sole idea here is, again, you have a particular protein that you're interested in where it's binding inside the cell at any given time. What you have to have to be able to do this, it's an immunoprecipitation. Immuno, when we talk about it in terms of molecular biology, means antibody. So if you have an antibody to your favorite protein, this is something that you can do. If you don't, it's way harder to do these processes. So one of the first things that lots of molecular biologists do as soon as you have made a protein, you make antibodies that will recognize that protein. So one of the very first processes to happen. So assuming you have an antibody to your favorite protein, so a gene regulatory protein, you have your cell with these different regulatory proteins bound in different places. And you're interested in what your yellow regulatory protein binds to. So you have the cell, you break this open and cross-link the proteins to the DNA wherever they happen to be with some kind of chemical residue. So these are now cross-linked. You break open these cells and then you break the DNA into little pieces. And all of these little pieces of DNA, some of them will be associated with the protein you're interested in, some of them will be associated with other proteins, but most of them will have absolutely no protein associated with them whatsoever. So the key is to pull the needle out of this particular haystack, and that's what you use the antibodies for. So the antibody to your favorite protein, you now use this antibody to precipitate, that's what the precipitation part is here, your particular protein and the DNA that it's attached to, you reverse the cross links that have been made to this particular protein, then you amplify this DNA and sequence it, determine what the sequence is of this particular protein. So it's a great way of figuring out what DNA your 
favorite protein is bound to inside the cell. Again, if you happen to have a antibody that will react with that particular protein. Um, this is also neat because antibodies can recognize modified proteins. So say you have a phosphorylated protein, or as we'll see in just a second, say a acetylated histone, and you care about where the acetylated histones happen to be on the DNA in the cell at any particular time. So that's also one of the things that you can do this process. Was there a question in the back? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the basic question here, and I'll paraphrase it, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, why do chromatin and immunoprecipitation versus cell X? So cell X um, is a completely artificial um, process. So you have synthesized nucleotides. So synthesize the nucleotides, pull out of that synthetic nucleotide pool what actually that protein can interact with. On the other hand, chromatin immunoprecipitation, you now find where that particular protein binds to in a cell at a particular time. So this is you know, really what's going on. Um, cell X is way easier to do than chromatin immunoprecipitation. <laughs> so that's part of the reason you know, why we even bother with cell X in the first place. Um, and you, there may actually be the protein that you think is a DNA binding protein might not even bind to DNA at all. And so if that's the case, then why go through all the process of chromatin immune precipitation if it's not binding at all? And so that you can find through the cell X process. Is it gonna bind? Another way to do this same kind of idea, looking for proteins bound to DNA in a cell at a particular time that doesn't depend on that last PCR step, and in fact is what's used much more commonly now, is something called chip-seq or chip sequencing. Method here is very similar to the chromatin immunoprecipitation that we had before. You have your proteins that you cross-link to DNA. You then, once you've done this cross-linking, you break the DNA into little pieces just by a sonication step or any other way you can break the DNA into little pieces. And then you isolate, in this case, the blue protein and that blue protein, because you have a specific antibody to that blue protein, that then binds to one of these beads. You then use these beads to separate this protein from all of the other proteins and DNAs in this mixture. Then once you've done that, you can remove the DNA and then when you do sequencing, you can actually map this particular DNA sequence to a place on your genome. Okay, where are we? Yes, yeah, so mapping back to the genome. Um, and we can do this because we have genome sequences. So human genome sequence, we have these, and we have this massively parallel sequencing. There's actually another way to look at this. It's actually a new method, which a group um, up at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center up in Seattle um, figured out which is a slightly different way about going about this process, but it's actually a, a really pretty powerful one and seems to work extremely well. So instead of doing this you know, whole cross-linking business and separating your DNA and protein complex relative to each other, what they do in this case instead is they have an antibody that interacts with their favorite protein in this case, it's actually a methylated histone H3 at lysine 27. They have an antibody to this very specific modification here. They take that antibody, they put it into a nucleus, together with this protein, which binds to antibodies, but also has a nuclease attached to it. And it's micrococcal nuclease. It's actually exactly the same nuclease that was used to discover how big nucleosomes were in the first place. That's now attached to the antibody, which is attached to your protein. This micrococcal nuclease bound to the protein, bound to the antibody, bound to the protein that you're looking for, can now cut the DNA right next to where that protein of interest happens to be, in this case, trimethylated histone H3 lysine 27, and will chop, and it will chop until it gets to where this transcription factor is actually bound. Then you 
isolate the DNA, get rid of all of the protein, and then you sequence all of those DNAs with some kind of high throughput sequencing mechanism, and then line all of those DNAs up with the genome. That's shown down here in this smaller panel where we have the genome down here at the bottom and all the genes, particularly important here are these black boxes. These black boxes are now going to be your exons. And then a standard chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment and the sequences which are gotten from there. And in fact, when I say standard chromatin immunoprecipitation, that's CHIP-seq like we saw in the last slide. And then lining up all the sequences with a particular part of the genome. So each of these vertical bars here corresponds to a sequence at a particular position. Let's focus right here. And here we can see there are a number of sequences that are right here, right next to this exon. And what that means is that there's a number of sequences which were precipitated with an antibody to lysine 27 trimethylated histone H3. So this is what you see in one of these CHIP sequence experiments. On the other hand, with this cut and run experiment, you also do exactly the same thing. You, know, you get a small piece of DNA, you sequence it, you line it up against the genome. But now you can see many more sequences right here, which correspond to the same place you've seen it with your chip seq, but also right next to where you have your exon. And so this is where that trimethylated lysine 27 histone H3 is bound to the DNA. And if you look in regions here again, where we have parts where you're right next to these exon sequences, that's where you find methylated histone H3 at lysine 27, three methyl groups that happen to be there. So that's all that I wanted to mention in terms of chromatin immunoprecipitation, all the methods, and then we can move on and talk about regulation, starting with bacterial regulation. But before that, we have a clicker question.